Good afternoon. It's um, Tuesday afternoon, uh, December the 3rd, and I uh, thought I'd talk a few minutes about uh, segment four, social, uh, social networks, and about the paper. I've been looking in the uh, discussion section, and there have been some questions raised by uh, three or four of you by email about the comprehensive uh, essay. Um, but let's let's we'll come back to that here in a second. Um, what we're doing in segment four, by the way, I just posted three profs notes, some that I've been whittling on over the course of time and some that I uh, cut and paste from summaries I had done on these articles uh, a year or so ago. Um, there are three profs notes, all three posted just now. Some are technical aspects about how to interpret the statistics that are the evidence, shall we say, of the um, relationship between health and uh, social networks. So some of it is technical, interpreting tables and looking at equations. Uh, some of it is interpreting those wonderful, well, at least I think they're wonderful Kawachi figures that will show uh, something about social networks along the x-axis and health on the um, y-axis. And then a lot of it is just conceptual types of, of uh, social networks, uh, instrumental kinds of networks uh, that help somebody get something done, or um, emotional networks that just gives you a sense of um, assurance that someone is there. And each one of those, in its own particular way, um, is conducive to good health. If you know you're not alone uh, emotionally, and you're not a social, you're not socially isolated. Um, that's one feature of support that is uh, good for health. And then, if you know that if you've got a problem to solve, and you're not the only one there to solve it, but there are others that can help you, even if it's a matter of needing to borrow an egg from your neighbor. Uh, that social interaction that we've talked about last time, the, um, the, the sense of trust uh, of your neighbors and um, the reciprocity in the relationship with your neighbors, all those things kind of help build the case that, um, of social networks as um, a supporting mechanism for good population health. We're always talking about population health here. Um, and we want to think about social networks as we have over the course of the semester, we began with demography, demographic events. Those are often the outcomes of interest, uh, types of mortality, types of morbidity, uh, features of child health, uh, particularly of those features that are on the birth certificate. Um, as outcomes of interest to us, as um, indicators, shall we say, if we look at that uh, original um, equation, where we've got um, health outcomes and social context upriver, the, um, the often the sorts of things that, that are recorded on um, vital data certificates are outcomes of interest to us, types of mortality and age of person who is, of the decedents and that sort of thing. And then we looked at the relationship between that in segment two, we looked at the relationship between that income and equality and this is not surprising to us, living in as unequal society as we do, that um, in areas such as ours, where um, income is not so equitably distributed, it creates stress. Uh, there are issues of access, of course, uh, but it's also stressful. And there was a lot about that in that segment, too. And that's how we were characterizing our ZI early on, as uh, differentials in income inequality. And then we got to thinking about it as we moved in to, towards the end of that and got into uh, segment three. It's not so much the income inequality, although it is that, and to some extent, how much money you have in your pocket uh, that enables you to get health care. Uh, but it's about um, the social dynamic that happens uh, that is a feature of a more equitable society or one that is not so equitably distributed, let's say. So that it's really not about uh, the income differential. It is about um, 
the lack of cohesion, the la lack of sense of belonging, the separation, the segregation, uh, the frustration, um, and that sort of thing that begins to wear on us and um, has that insidious effect that we've talked about in terms of adrenaline and we talked about that before and it's uh, you uh, like that biological plausibility in the early part of the of the course um, so it was social cohesion um, so where cohesion was high health was good uh, stress was low uh, so ZI we characterize it then as cohesion or social capital as one way of thinking about that and then as we've come to four segment four we think well you know how do you how do you see cohesion you know um, we operationalize it as social capital, uh, your sense of trust of your neighbors and reciprocity, things we were talking about a minute ago. Um, but really, it's, it's like networking. It's like your social networks, like your network in your neighborhood, your network in your family, your network that extends across the city, with, includes your uh, colleagues at work. Um, it is, in a way, the way we describe it in these notes, and we have previously, the fabric of society is woven together by an extensive system of social networks all kinds of networks the basic ones we were talking about a minute ago instrumental and emotionally supportive but we just it's a web of networking that um, enables us to function and enables us to feel well and supported and that's really what uh, for is all about so he started off with income, el income inequality. That's yeah, true, but it, it affects how well we get along in terms of our social cohesionness. Uh, if there's such a word as cohesionness, eh, we'll say that there is. And then it went from there, we decided that it's really about the networks that provide uh, the fabric for the cohesion or the lack of the networks that provide the lack of the cohesion. So that's what we're about in segment four as we come into these last two or three weeks of the semester. And um, you'll find three notes there that I hope will help you in, um, in coming to terms with, with uh, segment four. Now, um, I won't highlight any particular one. Most of these, uh, most of these um, authors you will have encountered in previous readings, uh, just they're writing on some, a little bit different on their topic. But take a look at those notes. And then when we look at the uh, comprehensive paper, um, there, because of the way the semester has, has gone, uh, there's no particular written assignment uh, that is specific to social networks. The instructions to you are to enfold social networks in some way into your comprehensive paper, um, your comprehensive essay. So let's talk about that for a minute, um, the essay. Um, as it happened uh, more times than I care to admit, uh, when we were setting this course up, or I was, when I went back to get some of the old notes and old readings from the graduate class I did two or three years ago, I was peeling those off and um, my colleague, Rendalinda Rana, some of you may have encountered her, had picked up that course from me and had changed some stuff, rightly so. And so we came down with some things that had Rinalinda Rana on them, including I, I thought I had corrected or laid out the, the uh, requirements for the, the essay, but I think I had inadvertently uh, done her blue colored one. Anyway, my intention was for it to be to 10 to 12 pages and not whatever it is that she had, which is some, somewhat more than that. So I have it right here in front of me. And... Um, I think uh, when we um, just go down through this, it's a comprehensive essay on a relevant, relevant course theme of your own choosing. And it'd be nice if you let me know, not because I'm going to approve it, but just because I know what it is. And then maybe I can offer su suggestions should you want to use me as a consultant. Um, but it is 10 to 12 pages. Uh, that doesn't include the title page or the references, so it's the content itself. Double spaced, one inch margins, and 12 inch font, or 12 point font. And you can pick a topic that you like. You may have found that there's a topic that you wrote one of the first three uh, reading assignments on, or writing assignments on, or something related to that, or you could just expand that out. That was a three or four or five page paper 
that you may have found something in social cohesion that struck your fancy and you can uh, elaborate that out um, and so uh, you know you want three um, outside sources what I mean by what, I, what I'm talking about there is a lit review and draw on the um, readings you don't have to go outside the readings that we have done um, there are some good chapters that we've covered in this in this text and some we didn't uh, the social support and social cohesion chapter eight in this book is particularly pertinent to segment four and there are some interesting topics here that you could read and maybe elaborate on neighborhoods housing and health social determinants of health in older age sexual health uh, there may be some things in this book that you can use I would use this uh, let this some aspect of this be one of your references incorporate some something meaningful out of this text um, for your paper that's not a requirement but I I think you would find something in there of help um, and then two or three four articles however you many you think uh, that you want for your literature review remember what the literature review is doing is it's helping you make your argument you're you've got a question you're answering and you're pulling references to support your argument uh, and you're also pulling references in a sense you know Kawachi's got some wonderful figures as to some of the others you may want to be able to you may want to go to an article or two and pick a pull out a figure copy it and stick it in your paper because it, it's particularly expressive of a point that you want to make why would you construct from new a figure or why would you blow off figures at all uh, visualizations are very powerful and you can write text about them so if you've got one two or three or four visualizations from Kawachi or some of the articles other articles tables or something out of the text that you think is particularly important to help you make your argument pull them out and um, insert them in your word document and text around them and uh, of course you want to attribute uh, be sure that you say that this is Kawachi's article whatever it is uh, figure whatever it is but uh, use articles as visualizations of your point the other nice thing about that is of course if you've got a table you don't want to make these the whole page because that doesn't look right but you know if you've got uh, a figure that takes up a third of a page or a quarter of a page um, that's a third of a page or a quarter of a page where you're instead of writing uh, eight or nine or ten lines of text you're writing some text but you're letting that uh, image tell the story so uh, be creative and innovative and think about how you can pull some of those things copy them and um, and stick them in your um, in your paper um, I think uh, let's you know sources for, derived from books and or peer-reviewed articles from academic journals um, let's just leave uh, your references for the most part unless you want to go outside that let's leave your references to the readings that we you've been assigned uh, readings that presumably because you were to have done this already read all of them anyway and you know which ones are uh, ones of interest to you so just confine your references to the readings that we have done and to thing and things from here as you need to do that if you want to go outside the reading them the set of readings that we've done please do so but I think you'd find it much easier and all the argument uh, support that you need for your argument will come from the readings that you have done all right so when we uh, go on down it says explore the so uh, that's a change in the sense when you read this as outside resources and all that sort of thing don't do that unless you want to we've you've probably got 30 articles that you've read over the course of some semester perhaps more several chapters in this book and there's got to be enough there for to support you in in whatever paper theme that you want to do so stay stay within the confines of the course and make it easier for you to make your argument um, all right so then it says explore the y equals zi as you lay out your argument you must do that uh, in fact I want to see the equation laid out uh, my y is this my xi is this my zi in particular is this you want to do your y equals zi for sure and um, and define wh how you uh, lay out how you're defining your ZI. Are you a social cohesion ZI? Is it a neighborhood style ZI with social networks? Uh, define your ZI. Make sure that your argument in your in your paper 
expresses the equation that's cent central to this course and that your paper is very clear that uh, it is about a contextual influence on some aspect of health. Uh, mental health of women or children's health or health of old men, uh, whatever it is, but be sure you've got a clearly stated and defined ZI in your argument. Um, all right, so that pretty much covers, I think, that. Uh, be the miscellaneous points, uh, be mindful of grammar, sentence structure, uh, be organized in the way you do this. This is not an opinion paper. Uh, you're not writing something for the editorial page of your local newspaper. This is science. This, uh, this is uh, courses about the science and all those articles that you've read including the book is a scientific presentation of the argument on social contextual influences on health. So be scientific as you write this out. No opinions. Now you can write a few things in your conclusion about how you think this works uh, but make your argument in the basic part of the paper scientific. Uh, and you've got the writing center and um, some other sources there that you can go to but be sure you've got good grammar, good sentence structure, organizational structure and all of that. And when you cite your references you can see what there is there. Now plagiarism, I left that in there because that was um, Arana left, uh, had bolded that one out. Now I'm not expecting anybody to plagiarize. Um, but uh, the university does, and you'll see in the syllabus, there's a statement about plagiarism there. I think where this comes into play is um, if you were to use a quote from one of the articles or that we've read, or if you were to uh, paraphrase it almost identically, you'd want to cite it. Don't claim something as your own if, um, if it's something that you are, you know you have a source for that particular thought or that particular point that you're making. Now at this point in the semester, if you've been into this, if you've been into this it, it, it can be difficult to separate out your own thoughts on contextual influences on health from what you have read. If you've gotten into this, you'll have a sense for it and it'll be intuitive to you and it'll be easy for you to express this. So then you have to think about when I'm saying something in particular that's specific, did I get that idea from Kawachi or Kennedy or uh, somebody, and if you you know you think about that, then you'd want to cite this idea I'm expressing right here, even though I'm not quoting it. It's an idea I got from Kennedy. You know, just whenever in doubt, it's better to cite. Okay, now uh, it's due um, on the um, let's see what do I have here? Sunday, December the 9th. Uh, that's coming up um, this coming Sunday. Um, and that's principally for to, to get everybody on the same page. Uh, there are half a dozen of you or so that are graduating and I have to put those grades in by December the 10th or 11th, I guess it is. Um, if I got the dates right, let's, let me make sure I got the dates right here. Um, sometimes I get the date wrong for the day, right? Let's take a look. I'm going to my iPhone and see. Um, um, it's Monday. Monday the 9th. Oh, it says Sunday, December the 8th. Um, I sent an email out a little while ago to somebody who asked who, whose paper was due um, by the end of the day uh, in order for me to put a, a grade in uh, by the 10th. So this is another change. Pay attention. Uh, this paper says Sunday the 8th, but you may take until midnight Monday the 9th. Uh, to submit your paper. And then those of you whose grades I have to report by 5 o'clock the next day, the 10th, I'll grade those first. And the rest of you, I have about a week uh, to grade those papers and report them, uh, I think by the 17th or something like that. So that's another change. There's two changes we've made. These bullets here, uh, keep your uh, references within the context of the readings and the book that we've done. Don't worry about going outside to build your argument. Um, and um, you have until Monday, um, December the 9th at midnight to turn this in. And um, I'll go back here in the, um, I'll go back in a minute into uh, the website. And if it says Sunday, December the 8th, 
then I'll put another one out there just in case somebody I don't think anybody's already posted anything I'll check and see if nobody's posted anything then I'll change the existing one to uh, Monday the 9th if somebody's already posted a comprehensive essay then I don't want to change it because that one will evaporate I'll just put another alternative uh, due date to make that Monday the 9th okay so um, that's all I have to say at this point and um, I'll be back in touch um, for one last um, go around I guess to say farewell for this semester um, towards the first part of next week if you have any questions as you really sit down and begin shall we say to sweat out that comprehensive essay you email me and um, and I'll call you back if you or call me I'll call you back you take care